Good morning. So good to see you all here today. For the people I can't see right now, people online and at Steiner Ranch uh, in one of our other Lakeline location venues, a welcome to you as well. And I got to tell you, I'm just full of joy being with you today. Uh, But there's a moment that happens every day that's not quite as, as joyful for me. And it happens at about 5.30 at night, and this tension rises up in me when I reach for my remote to turn on the evening news, and I'm like, do I have it in me? Do you know what I mean? Like, do I have it in me to see our craziness, to see our dysfunction, to see our division? And do I need Lester Holt to tell me how broken my world is, our world is. And do you guys ever feel that way? We can watch the news and we can just look around the world and it's like, I find myself saying, God, do you care about what's happening down here? Do you care about what's happening down here? I know you've got a, a better plan, you've got a better way, but things can just seem so hopeless sometimes. Like, how in the world are you going to bring about your good purposes in my soul and in my city, in the nation, on our planet? We've been looking at God's unfolding plan of redemption for the past eight weeks in our sermon series, Origins. I mean, hasn't this been a great series? Man, yeah. And we've been looking at some of the biggest questions that we can ask. Now, where did we come from? How did we get here? Why are we here? Where are we going? And in just these first chapters of the Bible, these first, these first chapters of the book of Genesis, now we've, we've understood some really big things. Firstly, that God created a perfect world full of life. He gave life to a perfect environment. He gave life to a perfect couple who had a perfect, life-giving relationship with God. And then sin entered the story. Sin entered the garden and into the hearts of humanity. And this relationship between God and mankind was broken. It was broken. This couple had to leave the garden. Their son murders their other son and sets the human race on this murderous trajectory with the exception of one man, Enoch, who walked with God, mankind who came from the dirt, has served the dirt and returned to the dirt in death. Mankind's sin and rebellion has broken everything. And it gets so bad. In Genesis 6, we see God look down on his creation and sees the state of our hearts. He says that the inclination of the thoughts of humanity are only evil all the time. Think about that. Only evil all the time. And with a broken heart, a heart full of pain and regret, God says, I'm going to wipe the slate clean. I'm going to start over. But there's Noah. There's a man, Noah, a man of righteousness. And God speaks to Noah, and he tells him what's going to happen. He tells him, Noah, I'm going to rain down my judgment on this planet. I need you to build this ark. Get your family on it. Get all the animals you can fit on it. Because this judgment is coming. So Noah does this. And God does that. Every man, woman, and child, every animal, every living thing is cleansed. It's destroyed in this flood. So while God brings his judgment on the earth, he brings a path of salvation for Noah and for his family. After 150 days of this storm and this waiting and this confusion and this anxiety, the ark hits dry land And as the flood waters recede, Noah steps out of the ark and into a new beginning. 
into a cleansed environment, and into a new opportunity to be in relationship with God. We're going to pick up right here in our story today. We're going to learn this. New life is offered through our promise-keeping God. New life is offered through our promise-keeping God. And we're going to see what happens with Noah in his new life, okay? So grab your Bibles or pull it up on your phone. We're going to spend the majority of our time today in Genesis chapter 9. But I want us to kind of reorient ourselves into the story. So go to the very end of chapter 8. And get your heads in this. This is Noah stepping out of the ark onto dry ground and a new beginning. Chapter 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Let's pause right there. What does Noah do in these first moments of his new beginning? He worships, right? He builds an altar. He builds this public place of worship, and he worships God. And Noah's worship is pleasing to God, and God purposes in his heart, I'm not going to destroy the earth again with a flood. Okay, now we're in chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And does that sound familiar? It should sound familiar if you've been with us in this series. This is the same directive that God gave Adam and Eve back in chapter 1, right, to fill the earth. He's saying, Noah, I'm starting over. And you've got the opportunity to do something different with this new life I'm giving you. And I want you to fill the earth with life. Verse 2, the fear and dread of you will fall on the beasts of the earth and on the birds of the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground, and on the fish in the sea, they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. So not only do we see this, this clear distinction of significance between mankind and animals, Noah gets some really good news right here. What's that news? God's saying you can eat animals now. This is a big deal. This was good news for Noah and his family. This is good news for us. I'm sorry, PETA, if you're listening, this is God's word. This is God's word. I'm sorry. Humans now have the freedom to eat animals. This is a big deal. But listen, it also comes with a warning from God. Listen to this warning he gives us in verse 4. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. He's going to say that again. I will demand an accounting for every animal. And from each human being, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. So is life, is life cheap to God? Does this sound like life is cheap to God? No. No. God is telling us that life is precious to him. But I don't know about you. When I think about Noah at this point in the story, I'm just a guy. Noah was just a guy. And he just experienced something really traumatic. He just watched 
everything on earth be destroyed except for these lives with him on the, on the boat, on the ark. And man, I think if I was in his shoes, I might be a little confused about that. Like, man, based on what I just saw, God, I, I, I get it. Killing is your deal. Killing's your deal. I just watched you annihilate the whole planet. You're the God of death, not the God of life. But that's not true. God was broken over the judgment that he had to bring to the world. Remember, his heart was full of pain about this. And if you noticed, in these three verses, God also stakes his ownership of life. Did you see that? He says that, I will demand an accounting. He says that three times. So God wants to make it clear to us that we are accountable to God for a life that we take. We're accountable to God for a life that we take. And God is establishing that we actually are our brother's keeper. Remember that from Cain and Abel? I'm not my brother's keeper. God's saying you are. And the way that you treat each other and even nature, how you do that with honor, that's tremendously important to him. God's saying you belong to me. Life belongs to me. Even the animals belong to me. In other words, God deeply values life. Is life cheap to God? No way. God deeply values life. And out of everything that God created, mankind alone is created what? In the image of God. In the image of God. Imago Dei. Made in the image of God with infinite value, with infinite worth. Human life is so precious to God that he goes out of his way here just to stress the sanctity of it. Stress the importance of it. Life is precious. God's the creator of life. He's the sustainer of life. And we need to understand that God is the owner of life. He's saying it all belongs to me. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. His desire is for us to both respect its value, but understand the danger of taking something from God. That doesn't belong to us. Life belongs to God. You feel that warning here in the text? God deeply values life. And speaking of life, God's going to continue this directive to Noah. Look at verse 7. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. So God, again, gives this instruction for producing offspring, for procreating, for multiplying on the planet. And we just read that, right, in verse 1, if you were like, it's deja vu right now. Uh, that should be a huge thing for us. Whenever you're reading in God's word and there's just clear repetition of something, almost verbatim, that should always make us pause and take note. Because oftentimes that's how God will signify something, highlight something specific in his word that's really important. It's all important. But when God repeats something like this, we should take big note of it. So by this repetition in verse 7, we can deduce that this was not a minor instruction from God. This is a major directive from God. And it also highlights something, something we're losing in our culture a little bit. It highlights the importance that we were created male and female. Our culture wants to get you confused about this. Don't let them do it. Look at the word of God. We were created male and female for a purpose. For procreation. To fill the earth with life. As image bearers of God himself. This is huge. I mean, throughout Scripture, we always see that having, having children is a blessing to God, always viewed as something valuable and good. But Noah's coming out of a culture that just didn't value the sanctity of life. It sounds familiar to me. It sound familiar to you? Oof. I've got to be careful here. Now, in verse 8, God establishes his covenant with Noah. This is so cool. This is so cool. What's a covenant? Well, a covenant is a pledged or defined relationship. 
A covenant is a contract. A covenant's a promise. All right? God's going to commit to mankind by making this promise. Let's read this. Starting in verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds and the livestock and all the wild animals, all of those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. Okay, so this is, this is a huge promise from God. Times and seasons will never cease until the end of history. And God's judgment against sin will never be delivered in the same way again. It will never be delivered through a flood destroying all life. Now, we see some different kinds of covenants in Scripture. And I just want to point out three really interesting aspects of this covenant, okay? The first aspect is this. It's an unconditional covenant. So what do I mean by that? An unconditional covenant means that God is going to uphold his end of the bargain, his part of the deal, regardless of what the other party does. Okay? We do see conditional covenants in Scripture, like his, his covenant with, with Moses is a conditional scripture. If you do this, then I'll do this. Uh, but this one's different. This one's unconditional. He's not really asking Noah to do anything in this covenant. And it leads to this. It's also unilateral. What does that mean? That means God alone is initiating this covenant. Okay? It's not like we see uh, Noah walk into God's presence and being like, Hey, can you give me a promise that you're not going to do that again? Because that was rough. No, we see God initiating this covenant alone. It's unilateral. And lastly, we see it's universal. It's for everybody till the end of time, including the animals. It's an unconditional, unilateral, universal covenant. And he doesn't stop there. God's going to back up this covenant with a sign. This is so cool. Verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I've set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and and all the life on the earth. Rainbow. So before the flood, it had never rained on the earth. So there never would have been a a rainbow in the sky. Can you imagine what this would have been like for Noah having this conversation with God, receiving this promise from God, and then God spreads this rainbow and Noah's looking up at the sky. And as the light is refracted in these water particles, and he sees this beauty. He sees a spectrum of colors he's probably never even seen before. And God is saying, when you see that, this is what this means. I'm making a promise to you. This is the sign of my promise. This is the sign of my covenant. What do you think of when you see a rainbow? An Instagram opportunity? Lucky Charms? They're magically delicious? I I feel like sometimes we don't even take notice of a rainbow. And to understand what it's actually signifying is huge. Man, when we see a rainbow, this should cause us to pause and praise. God, thank you. Thank you that you made this promise. Thank you that you're not going to destroy the earth 
the flood again. If you're a, a parent, if you, especially if you're a parent of, of younger kids, man, seeing a rainbow is a great opportunity to just give your kids a little bit of theology, impress your faith on them. You guys, you know that the earth, the earth got so bad that at one point God had to reset this whole thing. He had to start over and he sent this flood. But then he made a promise to us. And that promise still stands today that he's faithful. He's not going to do that again in that same way. Now there's something even deeper here. This is something as I've connected with Pastor Tim on this message, he's helped me understand this, this deeper meaning and significance. So this is really God choosing to visibly hang his bow in the clouds signifying both his past actions and this promise of this covenant. God's saying, when I used my bow, my war bow, that is what he brought judgment on the earth with. And God is saying, I'm going to disarm myself. I'm going to hang my bow in the clouds to say, I'm not going to do that again. Isn't that cool? I mean... <laughs> I just, the idea that, that God would say, this is, this is my war bow. I'm a warrior God, and I'm going to disarm myself and place my battle bow in the sky. It's huge. God's war bow, water, what he used to judge and defeat the earth. And think about this. This, this covenant with Noah, God's covenant with Noah, is one of grace and it's one that endures. There might be rainbows that we see today. It's kind of rainy out there. When we see a rainbow, God is still speaking. He's still speaking through it. And what is he saying? He's saying there's still time. There's still time. Turn to me. I made you. I wrote eternity on your hearts. You belong in a relationship with me. I love you. There's still time. There's still time. You want to know what I think about this too? This, this isn't here in the text. This is just my opinion. What is the completed icon of this bow? It's actually a, a drawn bow. With this orientation no longer at the earth but pointed at the heavens. Because the next time that God releases his arrow of judgment, it's going to pierce his son instead of us sinners. From our vantage point in the story, we know that the next time that God pours out his wrath, that his wrath will be satisfied in his son, Jesus, and that we will get invited into a new covenant, a new promise, a new covenant and the sacrifice of his son that gives us forgiveness of sin. I'm not going to look at rainbows the same way. How about you? Yeah, amazing. Back to Noah. And if there was any doubt in his mind about who God is and what he's like, I mean, you can just imagine that doubt and that fear just transforming into trust is God is saying, I'm trustworthy. I'm going to make this promise and I'm going to back it up. In other words, God deeply values trust. He's trustworthy. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. And he's not going to do what he says he's not going to do. He's a promise keeper. And new life is offered to us through our promise-keeping God. So what happened? How did we arrive here in the state of our world? We had a whole reset of nature. God reset it all. A reset of the planet, a reset of the human race with a new Adam, Noah. What happened? The temptation to sin remained. And in these last 11 verses of Genesis chapter 9, we're going to see a heartbreaking truth. 
that even the godliest people are prone to sin, and that sin is going to begin to unravel the world again. Sin has remained on the earth, and it's remained in the hearts of mankind. But we also see just another preview of God's grace and mercy here. Look at verse 18. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. Take note of that sentence. Verse 19, these were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. There it is. No one is immune to sin. No one. Not even Noah, the man of righteousness. Sin has remained on the earth and in the hearts of mankind. And now we're going to see this, another heartbreaking expression of sin. In verse 22, it says, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and went and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. And they walked backward. And they covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned away so they would not see their father naked. Okay? So one of Noah's three sons, Ham... He enters his dad's tent and he sees his drunk, naked dad there. And he runs and he goes and he tells his brothers. And maybe you're thinking right now, like, is that it? There's got to be more to this, this story, right? Well, here's what I would encourage you. There's been a lot of people who have wasted a lot of time speculating on this particular thing. What happened in that tent? Let's not go there. I would encourage you not to speculate because it's just, it's just not in the text. But what's valuable for us to do right now is, is to look at the responses of these brothers, to compare and contrast these two responses. One response is wicked and one response is godlike. One son, Ham, sees his father's nakedness and drunkenness and shame and he went and told his brothers to mock him. I mean, nakedness is a vulnerable state, right? I mean, literally being exposed. He's being exposed. Ham sees his father, the leader of their clan, in this drunk and vulnerable state. And instead of protecting him, he exploits him. Why does he do this? I don't know. I don't know, the text doesn't tell us, but maybe, maybe it's possible Ham always despised his father's righteousness. His father is this righteous man. Maybe Ham always hated that because of his own draw to sin and to the world. And in this moment, he walks into his dad's tent and he sees his sin. He says, ha, I knew it. Man of righteousness, you're a sinner too. Maybe he was overjoyed in this. Maybe it justified his own plunge into sin and darkness. I don't know. What we do know is that Ham is quick to disrespect his father. He looked on his father's naked body with this flippant attitude of disrespect and disregard, and he wanted to bring his brothers in on the joke of drunk, naked, old man in the tent. But man, we see something so different from his brothers, don't we? They walk in backwards. They cover up their dad in his sinful state with a garment. They don't even look at him. They show him dignity and honor, even in this humiliation of his, of his sin. I mean, think of it this way. Ham's response is the way of the devil. That's what the devil does to exploit and expose and Shem and Japheth, and this is the way of God 
to bring honor and respect. So Noah's going to sober up. Verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, cursed be Canaan. The lowest of slaves he will be to his brothers. Are you confused by that at all? Who's the guy that found him in the tent? Was it Canaan? No, it was Ham. Ham is Noah's son who exploited him. Canaan is Ham's son. So are you asking, like, why does, why does Noah curse Canaan? Well, you got to come back next week to hear about that. <laughs> I'm serious. We're going to dig in next week as we move into chapter 10. And this is just fascinating, fascinating stuff that we're not going to have time to unpack today. But I promise you, come back, come back and hear what this all means, okay? Here's the big nugget to take away from this. And I'd love for you, for you all to be chewing on this this week before we come back together next Sunday. The Canaanites become the arch enemies of the Jews. That's what we see in history. The Canaanites become the arch enemy of God's people. Ham is willing to expose and exploit, and this character flaw is going to move down his family line. So lots more to unpack next week, okay? Noah continues, verse 26, he also said, praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. Ken, we're going to get into this next week. Well, let me just say, there's been some horrible, hideous misinterpretations of what this passage means. Justifying slavery, one of the greatest evils that humanity's ever committed. That is not what this is saying, and we're going to hear that next week. But I just, I've got to say that out loud right now. So Noah's son, Shem... He's going to be the father of the Hebrews, the father of the Israelites. Think about it. These are the three sons of Noah. These are the three men who are going to be procreating and filling the earth. And Shem is going to be the father of the Jews. Japheth, this other brother that showed honor to his father, he's going to be the father of the Gentiles. The Gentiles, the non-Jews spread across the earth. The line of Canaan is going to stop. But the line of these two other brothers remain to this day. God blesses these brothers who honored their father and honored their family. Let me, let me just take a second and look at the family. Each of us have a family. We're born into a family. We've got a family right now. And God designed the family to be this significant place of honor. Nothing can replace the family. But when you look again at our culture, it's so broken down. It's so broken down. God desires for us to have God-honoring homes and homes where we honor one another and work through our sin. When we sin against one another, when we betray one another, when we let each other down, God wants us to work through those things, not expose each other's sin, not expose each other's failures and flaws. But we've got to understand that our culture is just more hostile to the family than ever before. I think it's listening to Satan. Satan wants to destroy your family, Satan wants to destroy your marriage. Satan wants to destroy your kids. And Satan wants to destroy these central relationships in your family. And at Hill Country, man, we value the family. We value your family. And you think about how God designed. I mean, that's where we're formed the most spiritually. It's where our character is formed. In our homes, with our family. It's the primary place where we pass on our faith to the next generation. And let me just say this, that 2021 is going to be a cool year for Hill Country because we are going to be revealing some of the new ways that we want to partner with you, come alongside you to have strong, God-honoring families, 
So just to say that out loud, there's more coming on that. But the family is important. It's significant. Okay, Genesis chapter 9 ends right here, verse 28. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Noah lived a total of 950 years. And then he died. And then he died, just like Adam, back into the dirt. The last years of his life not really seeming to match the first years of his life, just like Adam. And there's so many different parallels between Adam and the new Adam, Noah. And think about it this way. Adam and Noah, they both were in a covenant with God. We read in Hosea that, that Adam, too, was in a covenant relationship with God. Adam had a problem with a tree. Noah had a problem with a vine. Think about it. Adam had a problem with a tree and its fruit and disobedience with that. And Noah had a problem with a vine and this overindulgence and this sin. God covered Adam's nakedness and shame. And Shem and Japheth covered Noah's. Both of them, Adam and Noah, both are the givers of, of blessing and of curses. Blessing and curses. And finally, Adam and Noah both died. Adam, created from the dirt, returns to the earth in death. Noah, a man of the soil, returns to the soil, to the dirt in death. So what does this mean for us? How do we apply, this was a lot, how do we apply this to our lives? And guys, we've been asking a question throughout this series that I think is the most important question that we can be asking ourselves, and it's this. As a follower of Jesus, how will you emerge from this pandemic? How are you going to emerge out of this thing? What do we see Noah do in the first moments Coming out of his big crisis, he worshiped. How are you going to identify publicly with the people of God in worship? How are you going to use your gifts to serve God? Maybe there's new ways that you can serve him. We need to be open to God revealing those things to us in this season. How are we going to stand up against our culture? that wants us to immediately just fill up our schedules with stuff and the stuff that we used to do all the time. What does that stuff do? It deprioritizes God. This is my first challenge to you. I challenge you this week to spend time with God every day and ask him to give you a new vision for this new life that's in front of you. Ask God, what's one thing, even just one thing that I could do and take a step of faithfulness and obedience as we emerge out of this storm, our storm. And second, as we just have listened to this dysfunctional family story from Noah, I want to ask you this, as the follower of Jesus, how will your family emerge from this pandemic? What are this, what's the state of your family relationships right now? Would you say your God, your, your home is a place of honoring God? And that's my second challenge to you. As you spend time with God this week, ask him for the courage to repair any relationships that are broken from sin. It's a powerful thing. I had a friend just this last week that I came to and said, I feel like sin has gotten in between us. We repaired our relationship. How much more beautiful and powerful is that when it happens in your own family? Man, take an account of that. We've got this window of opportunity right now before the world tries to suck us back in to the old way of things. So ask God for one way that you can make your home a more God-honoring place. New life 
is offered through our promise-keeping God. And God is offering us a new way to live with purpose as we emerge from our storm. And Genesis 9 is a game-changing moment in our origin story. And it's our first glimpse of our inclusion in this story. What's the aftermath of the flood? It's grace. And our story is far from over. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you deeply value life. Thank you that you're trustworthy, that you're a promise keeper. And God, as your people, and as, as we wrestle, even just this week, with God, how do you want us to emerge from our storm? God, would you lead us by your spirit? And we do trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.